So on the first Sunday of Advent, we were challenged with this thought, that what we are looking for during this season of Advent and Christmas will determine what we see. So if we're looking for chaos, we'll see chaos. If we're looking for a mess, we'll, we'll see a mess. This past week, they were, there were angel feathers all over the building from the pageant last Sunday. And we can look at that, and there's so much to do, and say, oh, it's just a mess. But instead, what came to my mind was that song, I believe there are angels among us, right? If we're looking for trouble, we'll see trouble. If we're looking for the ways that the family isn't getting along, we'll, we'll see them. If we're looking for peace, we'll see peace. If we're looking for love, we'll see love. If we're looking for hope, we'll, we'll see things to be hopeful about. If we're looking for ways to be joyful, we will see ways to be joyful. I feel certain that you noticed uh, that we added two new things since our last formal sermon two weeks ago in preparation for the sanctuary. We added the purple cloth, which is a reminder of the royalty of Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. We added the manger, which we're going to talk about today. Um, but I also want to point out this, the gold ribbon that is coming down from the top of the trees. It's not just a decoration. It's there to remind us that the glory of Christ came down to earth in the form of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. What we are looking for determines what we see. On the second Sunday of Advent, we thought about this, that how we prepare for Christmas depends on for what or for whom we are preparing. That how we prepare for Christmas depends on for what or for whom we are preparing. Are we just preparing for a one-day event, Christmas, December 25th, or whatever it is, is your day to gather? Or are we just preparing for a two-hour event where people come and they open their presents and we, we have a meal together? If that's what we are preparing for, then that's really all we will experience. Or are we, are we preparing the way of the Lord in these days? That are the things that we are saying and doing opening the way for the Lord's presence to be there in a situation that you are facing or a friend is facing? Are we helping to soften a heart that maybe has grown hard towards the Lord, towards the church? How's it been going for you in these weeks? How's it going? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, please open our eyes to what you know we need to see. Open our hearts to what you know we need to receive. You know us better than we know ourselves. We are here. You have brought us here, and we are still. Pray that you would break our resistance, that you would crumble our pride, that we would be open to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So my husband, John,'s been leading one of the small groups during the Advent season, and they've been engaging in a study by Lee Strobel called The Case for Christmas. Lee is the one who wrote the book, The Case for Christ. And the titles of the sessions are Setting the Record Straight, Beneath the Fake News, a mind-boggling proposition, and the prophetic fingerprint. And the point of this study is to investigate the story of Jesus' birth by uncover uncovering the evidence that clearly supports the Bible's accounts. And in a day and age when there are, just seems to be more people who can't receive anything just by faith, I think that having this particular study um, as part of our church library uh, is uh, something that is of great value in these days. Um, so one of the things that uh, Mr. Strobel, Dr. Strobel, uncovers or addresses is the notion of Jesus being born in a manger in a cattle stall. 
which is what we've, we, the picture that we have in our minds, right? That in pageants and in movies and in books and in artwork, we see this picture of Jesus born in a, a cattle stall. But the question is, is it true? And if it isn't, does it, does it matter? Well, the truth matters. The truth always matters, and the truth will always matter. So first, we're going to look at the biblical account from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And I went back and got my uh, little red Bible that I received from my church when I was nine years old in 1966. It's looking a little rugged there. Um, but this is uh, the version, the, the Revised Standard Version, Luke 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled. This was the first enrollment when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be enrolled, each to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be enrolled with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to be delivered. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. So from this, over the centuries, we have been given dramatizations in the form of pageants and classic artwork and, and movies that put Jesus' birth in a barn out back of an inn that had no vacancy, right? I mean, that's, that's what we've got. And I think the reason for that is because of the words, and laid him in a manger. And laid him in a manger, because a manger is an animal feeding trough, and so it makes perfect sense to jump to the conclusion that Mary delivered the baby in a barn, because he was laid in a manger, and there was no room in the inn, and the baby was born and laid in a manger, so therefore he must have been born out back in a barn in a cattle stall or uh, a stable. The Greek word that is translated in is kataluma, which refers to a hotel-like residence, or it could also simply mean a lodging place. And many houses in this day had a wooden or a stone feeding trough on the ground floor inside for animals when they had to bring the animals in from outside when it was super cold outside. And so it's quite possible and quite probable, quite frankly, that Jesus was born in a house in a lower floor because it was all filled because of the census at the time. And therefore, because it was the lower floor, that's where the animals came in. And so that's why there was a feeding trough. Now, does this matter enough that we need to change our, our annual Christmas pageant to represent more of a room sort of thing instead of a, a, a barn sort of stable sort of look? Well, if we're going to be completely, perfectly, biblically accurate, folks, then that means all of our boys have to be not just the shepherds, but have to also be the angels. You remember that from years ago when we did the sermon series on angels? In the Bible, it is very clear that all of the angels that are spoken of in the Bible are male. Now, let me just put this out here one more time, um, that we don't become angels when we die. We remain what we are. Angels are a completely different kind of supernatural created being. And in the Bible, all the angels are male. So does that mean we need to change our Christmas pageant so that we have all boys or the angels what do you think, fellas? You want to wear those wings and those white flowy? Uh, maybe not. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that we're going to be thrown in some special jail because we are misrepresenting the biblical account. We're telling the story. We're trying to do it in a way that includes all of our children. But interestingly, in the last 10 to 15 years, I would say Bible translators, um, I, because of having a greater understanding of cultural and historical context, because of archaeological finds over the last number of years, they have altered verse 7 of Luke chapter 2. Instead of printing what I just read, laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the end, my 2011 New International Version, which I know a lot of you use, 
translated the verse this way, she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And I think that gives very much a different picture, doesn't it? And I think hopefully one that is more historically accurate. I mean, it's important for us as disciples of Jesus Christ to be informed. We need to be informed. We need to know the truth and the facts as much as, in, as is possible. But as we see that, as we hear songs that talk about the stable or a barn, as we see images and all of that, it doesn't mean that we have to you know, say, oh, that's just not true. I mean, we are going to hear those things, but we can't miss the main point. No matter where it is that you hear that Jesus was actually born. The main point really is um, the image that all of those places conjure up. It's an image in our minds of humility. It's an image of, of messy beginnings. It's an image of, I didn't think this is the way it was going to go, beginnings for Mary and for Joseph. It was an image of simplicity an image of the common man and the common woman making do with what had been provided for them and being grateful and being gracious as heaven came down and glory filled their souls. Was it the way it was supposed to be? By faith, I believe it was exactly the way that it was supposed to be. That God meant to break into the brokenness of this world in a way that we can relate to. And not in a way that was exclusionary. It's what Laurie talked about. Not in some palace with all of these riches around him. He came into this broken world in a way that all of us can relate to. He came into this messed up world and was laid in a hard, cold, and dirty manger. Most likely made of stone, not made of wood. Sort of like our hearts sometimes. Hard and cold and dirtied by sin, dirtied by anger, dirtied by unforgiveness and bitterness and immorality and abuse and addiction, dirtied by words that curse and do not bless, dirtied by the lies we tell and the apathy to God that we portray when we say, do you want to go to church today or not? Dirtied by a sense of pride that looks at others and says, I'm better than you. A manger is hard and cold and dirty, just like our hearts, just like my heart, just like your heart, just like the hearts of everyone, big and little, rich or poor, old or young, black or white, just like all of our hearts. Jesus came to be born into hearts like ours. No matter how hard or cold or dirty, no matter what you've done or what you've thought or what you haven't done or what you haven't thought, he came to be born into hearts like ours. And it is not a myth. And it is not a fairy tale that was made up to make us feel better about our lives. Jesus came. It is an historical fact. He was born in Bethlehem, just as the prophets had told 800 years before he came. He came to be born into hearts like ours. And no matter how many years, folks, you've been coming to church and sitting in the pews, if you have not allowed Jesus to be born anew in your heart, you're just going through the motions and you're missing it. You're missing it. You're missing it. Because when he comes, when he really comes to us, and we let him bring new life to our hearts. And we are born of new, not of flesh and blood, but born anew of God. Then everything important in our lives changes. Everything important in our lives changes from the inside out. Our hard hearts become soft. And our cold hearts are warmed. And our dirtied hearts begin to shine. All because of the sudden appearance and presence of Jesus Christ as it was for Mary and for Joseph, who became grateful and became gracious as glory, heaven came down and glory filled their souls. 
God planned it this way from before the beginning of time. Contrary to popular, maybe even majority belief in, in a lot of churches that Christmas is not when Christ, the story of Christ began. Christ has always been before the foundations of the world. Nothing was made that he did not make. Christmas is very simply, and I mean this literally, when faith became sight, when the word became flesh, when God became man, when the impossible became possible, when our hard hearts could be transformed into hearts of flesh. What you are giving others for Christmas depends on what you have received. What you are giving others for Christmas depends on what you have received. What you are really giving behind the packages and behind the cards and maybe behind the pies. What you are really giving depends on what you have received. And oh, how I pray that everyone here has received the fullness of Christ into our hard and cold and sin-dirtied hearts. How I pray that all of us have been re reborn into a life of true faith in Jesus Christ, the Lord. And how I pray that we are thinking about how our reborn ways of being gentle and humble in heart and being joyful deep in our souls, how, how I pray that we are thinking about how that can be displayed in our gatherings that we will have over the next number of days. How I pray that as it is in heaven, that earth will receive her king. As we prepare to come together in communion this morning on this final day of Advent, I want to read for you some words from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, he was, this is from his book, Life Together, and he talks about the sacrament of communion. He ministered to, in, he ministered in Nazi Germany. He was a teacher and a leader and a pastor in a very unique underground seminary and ended up being executed right before the end of the war. And these are the last words that he writes in this beautiful book about this community, this underground community, he says, the day of the Lord's Supper is an occasion of joy for the Christian community. Reconciled in their hearts with God and the brethren, the congregation receives the gift of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, and receiving that, it receives forgiveness, new life, and salvation. It is given new fellowship with God and men. The fellowship of the Lord's Supper is the superlative fulfillment of Christian fellowship. As the members of the congregation are united in body and blood at the table of the Lord, so will they be together in eternity. Here the community has reached its goal. Here joy in Christ and his community is complete. Really, for the first time since I've been around, this is the first year that we've shared communion together every Sunday during Advent. And we decided to do that because we sensed that there was a need, there was a, a desired fellowship with Christ and with one another that prompted this weekly sacrament, making tangible the intangible. There was a yearning and, uh, for the stillness in our preparations for Christ's coming. There was a rejection of autonomy. I can be a Christian all by myself. There was a rejection of that and an embracing of Christian community. And in receiving this sacrament every week during this season, I pray that we've been more prepared to see what God wants us to see, that we've been more prepared to prepare the way of the Lord wherever we are and and whoever we are with, and more eager to give to others what truly matters. Bonhoeffer said, here, here, meaning at the table of the Lord, joy in Christ and in his community is complete. Christmas is all about Jesus Christ and what he came to give us. And so, on this last Sunday of Advent, I pray that 
our joy would be made complete as we receive what all of our hearts so desperately need, that we receive Jesus Christ and all that he came to give. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your patience. We thank you for your love, your unconditional love. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. We confess that we have allowed ourselves to get hung up on the smallest things. We've chosen to look for things that do not honor you. We've chosen to embrace frustrations. We have chosen poorly time and time again. You came to save us from the schemes of the devil to keep us out of a relationship with you. And yet we've turned to our own way, seeking to save ourselves and others by our own means and by our own terms. Forgive us, Father. Forgive us for fears and worries and doubts and unforgiveness of others. Forgive us for not trusting you. We choose in this moment to forgive, to let go, to receive peace, to receive the truth that when we confess our sins, you, you erase them. They are thrown into a sea of forgetfulness. Help us to receive your forgiveness, Lord. And help us to come to this table with grateful and generous hearts filled with the glory of Christ. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.